So, welcome everyone to the Tuesday, March 12th, 2013 school board meeting. Um, if you'll all rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? No, thank you. Um, so, approval of school board minutes from the executive session on February 12th, the regular business meeting the same day, and the workshop on Tuesday, February 26th. May I have a motion? Uh, yes. Oh. You go no, you I'm go. I'm sorry. No, no, really. Please. Seriously. <laughs> Uh, I move that we approve the um, board minutes as stated in our um, packet tonight for items 2A, B, and C. You want a second, Michael? Yes, I second that motion. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? 6 0. Uh, on to comments by student representatives, seeing no middle schoolers in the house tonight. Um, Nolan. Um, so in the high school, uh, we have all kind of uh, been getting used to the, the new doors system. Um, I, it actually hasn't, with my experience, it hasn't been too, too bad. Um, and I, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's gone a lot more smoothly than they thought it would. Um, uh, so, so that's good news. Um, Chelsea, why not? Uh, the senior class president has recently sent around a um, sent out a survey so that seniors can start choosing uh, uh, speakers for our graduation and senior celebration. Um, also, winter sports are finished, and uh, spring, uh, spring sports will be uh, the signups for those will be pretty soon. Um, also, uh, the AP government classes um, will be taking their annual trip to Washington D.C. Uh, next week, so everybody's uh, very excited about that. Um, the largest group that's actually ever that they've taken, so it should be should be pretty fun. Um, and also, our uh, next student council meeting is tomorrow morning, so um, should have have uh, more more news after that. Thank you. Any questions for the student representative? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, on to comments from the public on agenda items. We have no public tonight, so I assume we have no comments from the public. Um, and so from there um, to communications. And before you start, I have just a brief item. I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the, pass the passing of Buddy Earl, a 36-year uh, teacher and mentor at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. During his tenure at CEMS, Buddy positively influenced the lives of thousands of students in their most vulnerable years, encouraging them to think independently but act with their community in mind. Mr. Earl was such an important figure at the middle school that some of our current teachers were his students. His contributions are immeasurable among students and faculty alike. And on behalf of the board, I would like to express our sympathy to his family, in particular his wife, Kathy, who taught Jim at the high school, and his daughter, Gretchen, a middle school guidance counselor. So thank you. Thank you. Meredith. So letter A is recognizing the speech team. The speech and debate te uh, speech team were state champions again. They were, are not able to join us this evening, but we may be able to have them attend a future meeting. But um, so moving on. Uh, under retirements and resignations, Sherry Gower, who's a library ed tech at the middle school, has given notice of her resignation. So we appreciate her service to the district. And uh, superintendent's report. Okay. So our high school also won the state chess title uh, over the weekend. 
we want to congratulate them. Um, those students are Matthew Fishbein, Brett Parker, Matthew Reale Hatem, Ben Hansel, and Colm Smith. And they will be going to Nashville, Tennessee in April, um, pending board approval of the trip, of course, uh, to, represent, to represent the state of Maine. So congratulations to them. That is two years running. A uh, couple of middle school notes. Um, the middle school sponsored at the end of February a program on internet safety and digital citizenship um, that I think was uh, it's always helpful information for parents just to understand um, where middle schoolers are and to open that dialogue with, you, with your child. And if you would like further information about that, please don't hesitate to call the middle school. Uh, the career fair was also held last week at the middle school and I want to say thank you to um, our volunteer coordinator, the fabulous Gail, um, for her work on that, but also um, thank you to the many um, local people, business owners, um, parents, and volunteers who came forward just to talk about the work that they do professionally. And um, it was a great turnout, and I heard lots of buzz from the kids. And you know, it's, it's a great time at which to be thinking about what you want to do with your life and just explore the possibilities. And the one thing that I heard over and over, sort of making the rounds of some of the speakers that day, was do something that you love. Um, you know, work hard, but make sure it's something that you enjoy. And um, that really resonates not only with our mission and vision and values, but um, also resonated with kids. The high school uh, one act plays are going on. They were last week and they'll also be next week, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday evening. And this Thursday night is the high school um, music concert, band and chorus performance. Thursday, yes. Yes. <laughs> I have to remember which day it is occasionally. That's always challenging. Um, Literacy Professional Mondays are ongoing. We have one more. Um, but I've received several emails from staff just commenting on their enjoyment of um, the professional time spent together and um, how valuable they've seen some of those activities and they've been able to imply them in the classrooms. So that's a very positive piece. And thank you to the many teachers who are helping to facilitate that work in addition to some of our administrators. Uh, principal search for the middle school principal has begun. Um, applications were due a week or so ago. The search committee met yesterday to um, select candidates to interview and we will be holding interviews next Tuesday and we'll move that process forward from there so hopefully we will have a nomination for you at the April meeting. We'll see how that goes. And finally strategic plan. The strategic planning group met last Friday and I think we'll have a draft, um, has a draft almost fully realized that it will um, be polishing up and sending out um, to the board but also to schools and administrators to fill in some of the other pieces to bring forward to you um, before the end of the year a more fully fleshed out plan with some specifics. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, wait. I almost forgot my other list. <laughs> that was just the middle and high school news. I also have my whole Pond Cove list because Pond Cove has been doing a lot of work around um, climate in particular. Uh, yesterday, um, Stan Davis was there visiting the school and he did um, some work with the faculty and there were student surveys going on and he um, also did a parent presentation last night. Um, last, well actually yesterday too, but sort of Friday. Um, what we had left of Friday was Read Across America Day, so um, some students got to see a performance of the Sneetches featuring few performers like their principal um, and some other staff members and I heard all about the jumping that was going on behind the scenes as they were putting their stars on and taking them off. Um, if you're not familiar with the Sneetches story that probably makes little sense. Um, but uh, Go back to Pond Cove if you're not familiar with that story. That's <laughs> true. You can, you can attend a command performance. Um, this Friday March 15th will be Beach Day at Pond Cove sponsored by the parent Ponco Parents Association and the Beach Blanket Bingo fundraiser will be going on that evening. Um, as a reminder, we have an early release coming up on March 29th um, for K-8 conferences and um, the Middle School Musical is also going on at the end of the month. Now I'm... Thanks again. It's going to be that time of year. Uh, on to <coughs> item 6A. Um, consideration to approve the mock trial team trip to the National High School mock trial competition in Indianapolis, May 8th through 12th. Do I have a motion? 
Sure. I move that we approve the mock trial team trip to the National High School Mock Trial Competition in Indianapolis on May 8th through the 12th, 2013. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? Well, proud of them. What? We're very proud of them. <laughs> well, we've got a member right here if you wants to. I, uh, I actually won't be attending the Nationals this year. I went last year when we went to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, it's usually, it's just, uh, it's actually on a volunteer basis. We don't actually, uh, we always, obviously the past three years that we've won, we always get a team together, but they, it's usually a lot of, uh, like it's a lot of, um, I guess, juniors and sophomores do it because seniors tend to have a lot of their AP tests are actually during um, the competition. That's uh, the reason I can't go. It's because uh, I have uh, quite a few AP tests um, during, during that time, unfortunately. But um, otherwise, I'd definitely be proud to go. And I'm uh, very proud of the team for uh, representing Maine for the third year in a row. So, One additional thing I would add is that this gives uh, Cape Elizabeth a chance to compete on a national basis with virtually all of the states, and each year we've improved um, uh, against, like for example, California had eight, that's some large number of lawyers hired to help them just for the national competition. They rented suites and did all kinds of things. And um, I, I think it's a great opportunity to compete on a national basis and for keep kids to realize they're as good as anybody. It's that was proper English. Thank you, David. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? OK, 6B, girls lacrosse. May I have a motion? I move that we approve a varsity girls lacrosse trip to Cushing Academy April 19th and 20th of this year. Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? 6 0. Um, item 6C, robotics. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the high school VEX robotics team travel to the 2013 VEX robotics high school world championship in Anaheim, California, April 16th to the 21st mm -hmm. of this year. Second? Anyone? Second. Any discussion on robotics? Again, there's another team that we're incredibly proud of. I mean, these kids, I've watched them through the middle school compete all the way up and, you know, go Cape. We've got some awesome, talented kids. Where's the luck? Okay, all those in favor? Thank you. So, okay, item um, D, consideration to point, appoint a school board representative to Cape Elizabeth proposed library planning committee. This is a committee created by um, the town council to take another look at the library issue. Um, and I have a nomination um, to, this com <laughs> to this committee, and it, which is Kate Williams Hewitt. And um, I, Kate has offered to to serve on this committee, which I appreciate very much, and Kate will do a terrific job um, representing the board on, on the committee, and, um, and uh, we, we, um, we wish this committee um, uh, best of luck in its efforts um, to find a, a solution that helps produce a, a, a solution to the, the degradation of the, the library building and, and, um, and uh, helps contribute to the lifelong learning mission of Cape Elizabeth schools um, by producing a, a facility for all Cape residents to um, have access to books and media. So thank you, Kate. No problem. Um, Do we need a motion? Yes, please. So we need a motion. Sure. I, I move that we appoint uh, Kate Williams Hewitt as our representative of Cape Elizabeth's proposed library planning committee. Second. Any further discussion? I guess I got ahead of my. Can I just make sure everyone uh, understands very clearly that this is, the school board does not have supervisory responsibility over the 
library planning committee. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a town council committee that the school board was invited to have a representative. So I'm not sure who's the chair of the committee, but it, it's, uh, I think, what is it, three town, two town council members or three? The so it, committee has five, five members um, and three town council members and a member of the library board. Um, the committee was created by the town council, uh, which invited the school board to nominate a member. Um, and it's a good point. Um, the school so, board doesn't have any authority over, the, over this committee. Right, so if any citizens have any questions on the committee, direct those to the, the town council or the library, just so there's no uh, c confusion over our role in, in the committee. And, and just to follow up on another point you made, I, I believe that the committee um, is waiting for the school board appointment at this point, and um, then will uh, set a meeting, its first meeting, uh, time and during its first meeting will appoint a chair from among its members um, and will set future meetings. Um, and Kate, I know you're busy as a working mom and a school board member and appreciate your, your contributing your time to this, this effort too. Thank you. Happy to. Uh, could I add one thing just yes. in, in plainer language that the, uh, this is a town council committee. It reports to town council. The town council is the one that makes the decision. Uh, I, I believe we were only asked for put somebody on to get input about possible effects on education. But it is not uh, in any way related to nor our responsibility and, uh, uh, on decisions concerning the library, except, quite frankly, the citizens. So I'm just trying to further amplify what Michael was saying. Thank you, David. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Item E, consideration to appoint a school board representative to Cape Elizabeth's Town Center Planning Committee. Um, this is also a town council created committee to take a deeper look at the, um, at the town center uh, and a previous plan that was created for the town center, many elements of which were never implemented or fulfilled. Um, this committee will produce its own uh, agenda, I think, but we'll get back to the town council. I believe they're due to report back to the town council by the end of the year, I think is their time line. Um, and in the spirit of um, never miss never miss the rule that you should never miss a board meeting. I have a nomination for this committee. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Mary Townsend. <laughs> uh, agree. Mary, Mary volunteered um, and is eager to, um, to join this, this effort. That'll to teach her. A close look at the town center. Um, <coughs> so it's not a surprise nomination. Um, so may I have a motion? I move that we appoint <coughs> Mary Townsend as our school board representative to the Cape Elizabeth's Town Center Planning Committee. Because she's not. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? No. All those in favor? Six zero. <laughs> um, item F consideration to approve a middle school guidance counselor job share request for the 2013-2014 school year. And there's a reference to school board policy GCGC, I think that says. Yes. Um, on teacher job chairs. May I have a motion? Yes, I move that we uh, consider the uh, request for a jo uh, the job share request from the middle school guidance counselor for the 2013-14 school year. I think David would point out that you have to move to approve it. Okay. Do we? Uh, I move that we approve. Whether we approve it and then if. Okay, I move that. Okay, I move that we. Approve a middle school guidance counselor job share request for the 2013-14 school year. Okay, thank you. Second, sorry, Mason. Elizabeth. Okay, discussion. Meredith. I'll just speak briefly to um, 
OCGCGC, if that's okay? Yes. Um, OCGCGC um, sends the decision on job shares to the board. Um, people have the opportunity to apply um, for a job share and submit a detailed proposal, which has been um, done in this case. And um, those applications for job share have to be received by March 1st. The philosophy behind a job share is essentially that um, you have to satisfy the board that you can maintain a high quality of instruction and services to students, and that's really um, the decision back there for the board. Okay, any further discussion? Um, I would like to point out that when we do read the philosophy in its whole for the job share code on the um, policy GCGC, GC, teacher job share, um, the full philosophy reads that the school board recognizes that the flexibility in employment practices can be mutually beneficial to the staff and to the student body. And it's that and to the student body that weighs most heavily in my decision making on this particular topic. Each job share proposal will be reviewed with the maintenance of high quality of instruction and services to the student as the primary factor. And I have to say, um, Gretchen's work at the middle school is above average. It's exceptional, it's incredible. The students love her and she has a lot to offer. Um, the nature of the guidance counselor position, however, um, with its unstructured um, need for students and unable to structure when the students may need her most, um, to me does not meet the full philosophy of the job share um, policy where students is the primary factor. So in thinking through this, um, I'm not quite sure because of that factor that this would be the best service to the students in the district. David? Um, I agree with uh, what, what you just said, but I would, I would add that the, that the applicant, um, based on my read of the policy, has the burden of demonstrating to the satisfaction of the school board that's in the best interest of the Cape Elizabeth School Department, that the best interest of the Cape Elizabeth School Department would be served. She has the burden of proof. In Lori, I mean, we have to be convinced. She has the burden of showing us, and I, I, I agree. I don't think it's a job sharing in that type of position in middle school um, she gave some good reasons, but I didn't think she satisfied the burden of showing us that it's in the best interest of the school department that it be granted. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'd have to, reading through um, Gretchen McCoy's um, seven pages of detailed, um, her job description, her, her tasks that she does on a weekly basis or a, a yearly basis, it's, amazing what a guidance a counselor needs to do and that I know I my children have had the blessing of working with her for the last three years or three of my children have had the ability to be in, in the middle school with her and her dedication and she comes early she stays late her car's in the parking lot I actually think um, it would be impossible to do this amount of tasks during three days with her level of um, work ethic and so I also unfortunately um, would have to say no that I don't think it would be fair to her as a, um, a teacher provider as well as to the students. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I would just add that, uh, that um, on top of what everyone else said, that the, this, this board, I think, has demonstrated a, a, a commitment to um, the concept of, of flexibility in, in, um, in, in, in teacher jobs and, and has uh, supported, um, again and again, applications for, for leave um, on, the, on, the, you know, on the grounds that um, people who have the opportunity to view their um, jobs from a distance um, and, and choose to come back to them are often um, better energized and, um, and uh, uh, more worldly in their approach to their, to their work. And, and um, so I think the, the, the board has, has given this deep consideration, but 
Um, I, I share the concern of the people who um, are worried that, that, that um, if, if our, our primary factor in our decision has to be the quality of instruction and services to students, um, that dividing this particular job, this, this counseling job among two people um, produces a high likelihood that we're, we're not, in fact, doing that job of, of maintaining the high quality of instruction and services. And um, so I, I share that concern. David? I, I just like to add some, I didn't want mine to sound so cut and dried uh, with a legalistic standard, but I think there's a reason for a high burden. I think inherently job sharing is a good thing generally speaking, but you have to look at the facts of the particular circumstance. When a guidance counselor is some of the kids need when they need them, and um, it's not something that inherently lends itself, they, they have to develop a relationship, especially young kids with a guidance counselor. I don't think it lends itself to a very easily, in fact, I wouldn't say impossible, but it would be very hard to demonstrate that a job sharing would be as effective as a full-time person because the kids just have to establish a relationship of trust and confidence. So I, I, I accept what everybody says about what a great person and great guidance counselor she is. I'm not sure anybody could satisfy the burden. So that's why I would am um, indicating my negative view. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other comments? All those in favor of the motion? Do we ask? Yeah. Opposed? All opposed? So zero six. Um, item G, consideration to approve a second consecutive leave of absence for 2013-2014 school year for high school teacher Gretchen McNulty. May I have a motion? Um, I move that we approve the second consecutive leave of absence for the 2013-2014 school year for high school teacher Gretchen McNulty. McNulty. Sorry. Second? Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Meredith. So I'll just be briefly. Um, the teacher's contract allows teachers to request a year um, leave of absence um, for professional work, which is what Ms. McNulty requested last year. Um, she was on a leave of absence to um, teach in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, the contract allows teachers um, then to request an additional year, but it is at the board's discretion whether or not to grant that additional year. And uh, as always with decisions you make, I recognize that there are um, a number of factors that, that you weigh in those decisions. Thank you. Any other comments? John? David? Um, I think I, we should make it clear that this is a fact specific and it's completely within our discretion whether or not we do something like this. Based on um, the recommendation of Jess Shedd, who knows her very well, and uh, some of our experiences with her as a superb high school in, uh, history teacher, um, I think it presents a, um, perhaps not unique, but a very strong case for approval due to the, her long-standing uh, work at Cape Elizabeth her excellent reputation, uh, her support among the student body. Um, that's what you would need to give somebody a second year at something like this, because there's always a risk that it might not come back. But she's considered overwhelmingly such a good teacher and has dedicated a long time to her tenure and spent a lot of her tenure and her time in the Cape Elizabeth system going above and beyond the call of duty, I think is something that, in this case, she's valuable enough that I would support giving her a second year. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, yes, I would, um, you know, I think it's just a challenging decision giving, uh, you know, weighing the, the skills of the individual requesting the leave of absence as well, you know, as the inevitable challenges on, um, you know, meeting student needs. And I would just say that if, um, just to share that th she's on a leave of absence, but more specifically, a lot of the work she's doing are areas that uh, we're focusing on as, as a district. I would just share, you know, she's working on, um, you know, leadership training, integrated unit design, word study, standards-based grading, um, as well as one of our mission and vision statements is really to have a, a global perspective, and there's no better way of getting a global perspective than living uh, outside, um, you know, 
uh, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, you know, I weighed that against uh, the reality of uh, having someone away for two years. Um, you know, someone has to teach those students in the interim. So um, my hope is that uh, Gretchen does return, and I would say would weigh heavily on future decisions of this nature if someone, um, you know, who wouldn't return, given that's the trade-off we're making. So I, I do hope Gretchen uh, is committed to returning after one year and brings her experience. And it would weigh heavily to me on future decisions if someone of this magnitude requested an extended leave of absence and decided not to return, given um, you know the inevitable uh, challenges of, of finding someone to replace her in the interim. So, so I support it, but uh, I hope, hope she does return. Thank you, Michael. Any other comments, Joe? Um, I would just like to um, reiterate what Michael said. Thank you very much. You bring up a very good point. The return on investment in this particular scenario, um, she's a highly regarded teacher who has a commitment to the community and to the high school and her teaching as well. And I, I would just like to read a small paragraph from her letter of request for her leave of absence to sort of give um, a, a view or a, illustrate what is impacting my decision on this issue. And she writes, I have worked and planned intensively with students to travel on global action program expeditions and model UN simulations. She has traveled to China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam, and plans to travel to Thailand and Australia in the next few months. Her carefully construed worldview has been shattered and is being reframed as she confronts the cultural realities she had never imagined. To bring that type of new global perspective to the classroom, I think, is worth the return on investment to taking a flyer for a second year. Gretchen. I think, if I may add, that's two very good points. And I would point out that she does teach world history. So this is directly related to what she specializes in. Hmm. Any other comments? All those in favor? 6-0. Okay, sorry. Item H, consideration to approve a slate of policies for second reading. Um, Joe, would you like to make a Well, I would love to make a motion on this. Um, I move that we um, adopt at this point um, the following policies um, as listed out in item H. I won't read them all um, in tonight's agenda. And for those of you who may not have a copy of tonight's agenda, they are the first few up until um, of the B section of our policy manual. A second. Well, just to clarify, uh, the motions to adopt them, but the very last one would be to not. To, yes, I'm so, so sorry. So, just um, so. To recommend it for deletion is policy BBABR, which is the Student School Board Representative Guidelines. Second. Okay. Um, discussion, David. Um, I, I do have one comment um, that I think uh, there has to be one change made uh, because we amended an earlier policy, and, and now uh, the school board code of ethics, section six, um, says that each school board member will recognize they have no legal authority as an individual outside school board meetings, and will conduct myself with sensitivity to that fact. Well, we did a approve a provision that allows the school board member with direct delegation by the board to act on behalf of the board. So I think six should be changed with, and that's authorized line, except this may be delegated by board or by policy, would we'll then make that section six correct. Yes. So my recommendation would be just that procedurally it might make sense to take that suggestion, take this, pull this policy from the slate, take it back to the policy committee to make sure we fully understand the wording. Absolutely. I, I apologize for not raising this earlier. It's something about Monday mornings early that just... What slipped you, David? <laughs> That's... <laughs> Nothing to do with daylight savings time, I'm sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> so That's should BCA. I give you a new motion? Yes. Yes. Or just revise the motion? motion? Okay, so I amend the previous motion to say, in addition, we shall pull out um, policy BCA um, for further consideration at the policy um, committee level. 
Okay. Is that, is Just our, uh, Thanks, David. Transcript reader going to understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so the motion is to approve all the policies except the BCA and, and to delete BB, right. BBA B dash R. May I have a second? I have a second to the oh. amendment. Okay. Okay. And is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Six zero. Okay. Item I. Consideration to, of the following policies for first. Read. Cho, do you want to? Yes, please. No need for a motion, but um, you There's can no tell need us for it. a motion? No. Just any comments. No, but if, if, if there's any, anything you would like to advise the board about these particular policies, you may. And if not, um, board members should be reading uh, these policies because they will be on our agenda next month for yes. vote. So if you have comments on these policies, if we do have comments on these policies. <laughs> Stop looking at me. Then they I didn't mean to look at you, David, but if we do have comments then, on these policies, if you could please get them to us by March. I do have a couple of comments, and I will try to get them Thank you. to you quickly. So we meet the first Monday in April, so if we could get those One week at in least advance. a week in advance of that. And Meredith is really good with her iPad, so I'm waiting for her to come up with the magic date. One moment. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I didn't mean uh, to put you on the Monday, spot. Monday, April 1st, actually. There we go. Simple. Is our next meeting. Yes. So comments to us by March, the week before, whatever that Monday is. Got that? By Friday the 29th of March, does that work? Yes. Oh. That would be better. So even just a few days. Sure. Stop looking at me. <laughs> Did you have something to add? Well, Two, two specific things. Um, one, the policy committee will be actually looking at um, some possible options for combining policy BDE and BDF. Our meeting um, was scheduled for a week ago and was postponed, so we only met yesterday, so we didn't make that change to the agenda, but that was our discussion yesterday. Um, additionally, I will point out that the board will need to provide some feedback to the committee, committee on policy CBI evaluation of the superintendent because you will see that there are two versions of that policy. Um, the one that the board um, adopted a couple of years ago as well as a recommended sample policy from Drummond and Woodsum. So I know that's one. Um, but the, the, the committee um, wanted to provide you with both versions for feedback on that one specifically. Uh, I'm confused. May I ask a question? Do we just, didn't we just approve one for the board superintendent relationship? Yes, but yes. that's different. That's different oh, than the different. evaluation of the superintendent. Okay. I'm is sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. My it, the policy on evaluation gets specifically to how the evaluation is done. I didn't hear the word evaluation. Exactly what, okay. Exactly what steps the board I see follows. I, I now see it, sorry. Okay. And maybe I should also note that the recommending for deletion um, under those second readings is um, policy BEC-E, executive session law. It's a law, so there's really, that's what it is. It's not a policy. And the um, policy CA, administrative goals, um, weren't necessarily policy. They were more of administrative type of purview that falls under um, the superintendent's office job duties. That's a good way to explain that. But so sort of the explanation of why we're cutting. The only thing I would add to that is that part of the task I think that the policy committee identified was wanting to narrow the scope of the manual a little bit. So it's um, relying on guidance from Drummond and Woodson about what policies are required, what policies do they recommend, and then looking at individual policies that don't fall into that category and making a determination whether it's something that needs to be decided at a board level or whether there might be administrative procedures internally that can cover those pieces. The only thing I have on the anything with evaluation, I know there's uh, state legislation. There's. Um, it's not the teacher evaluation, though. It's, it's the superintendent. Right. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say for anyone that has to do with evaluations, um, overall, just. You know, I'll be looking ahead to see what those 
you know, either teacher evaluations or is there anything in there in terms of, you know, whose role it is to evaluate the teachers, you know, at some point it might get up to the superintendent. So I guess I'll send a comment, just a question on to make sure those are, are, are consistent so we don't have to go back a year or two from now and revise those to reflect, you know, our overall strategy on teacher evaluation because ultimately, you know, our view is, you know, you have the superintendent is our main uh, administrator person overseeing those so maybe mm -hmm. if you could just flesh that out as you as you go through those and we have been getting some great counsel from Drummond and Woodsum on what is our legal requirements for those types of things and at the state and federal level I think that that piece is also shifting legislatively there may be some changes for teacher evaluations coming down so we will keep an eye on that thank you Any other discussion on these policies? Okay, on to item J, consideration to approve a slate of athletic extracurricular staff nominations. May I have a motion, Elizabeth? I move we approve uh, the listed athletic extracurricular staff nominations in our packet, item 6J as a slate. Second. Second. Joe. Uh, any discussion? Okay, I would just point out to the uh, public that we meet, typically meet in executive session in advance of board meetings to discuss any personnel matters that we can't discuss publicly. Um, and so if there are any such matters, the board discusses those privately in executive session and has, done, has had that discussion and that's um, part of the thinking that goes into our, the judgments that we make on this sort of uh, motion. Um, no. I would ask if there are any comments that the public have in regards to any of this slate, either bef either now, moving forward, or for next season. They should direct those comments and concerns to the athletic director? Yes, that's correct. That was a question at the end. That's what yes. I was no. <laughs> so, Yes. That is correct. Those kinds of questions should be directed to the athletic director. Perfect. Okay, all those in favor? Item K, consideration to approve the superintendent's administrator contract renewal recommendations for 2013-2014. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the superintendent's administrator contract renewal recommendations for the 2013-2014 school year in accordance by law. Hold on. A uh, second? Elizabeth. We don't need to. Lift. The slate, I should say. Meredith? I can just identify the slate. Um, Jane Golding is um, being recommended um, to continue it on as the Director of Instructional Support. Ellie Hassan, who would be second year um, probationary principal at Pond Cove School. Eric Kramer, to continue as the District Technology Coordinator, it would also be his second year and Doug Purley, who is currently the interim principal at the middle school, is being nominated to be the assistant principal at the middle school for next year. Any discussion? Well, I, I, don't, I just wouldn't want the moment to go by without thanking each one of these individuals for the, the hard work that they've done on behalf of the students and the district um, before we move forward. And I'd like to add that um, we did discuss each person at length and this uh, extension was recommended by Meredith based on observable facts um, and, re and, and her recommendation, which we give a great deal of weight to. But um, it is these people do, do deserve to have it, uh, the motion granted. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? So, um, item seven, committee reports. Do we have any committee chair people who care to report to the board? I have nothing new to add for the policy committee. Okay, thank you. No, no, okay. 
Um, I just I, note the Buildings and Grounds Committee will be meeting this Thursday. Uh, yes, we will. <laughs> okay. Um, item eight, school board agenda requests. Are there any agenda requests for future meetings? Okay. You can always send those to my attention or to Meredith if you have them. Thank you. Item nine, announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, the Building and Grounds Committee will be meeting <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> the Policy Committee will meet again on April 1st. And the, the, the school board is shortly to adjourn and reconvene in a workshop meeting to um, try to catch up with our budget cycle. Um, and so we have that meeting coming up right after this one, uh, which leads me right into item 10, um, a motion to adjourn. I move that we right. adjourn. Hold on one second. Before we do that, can we just announce the other budget workshops because we won't have another oh. televised meeting? Yes. Thank that. you for pointing that out. So they are March 19th, March 26th, and March 28th. So those budget workshops take place in the high school library. Um, and we welcome public participation in those workshops um, by way of audience. And um, we're meeting every Tuesday in March and one Thursday at the end. Just to clarify, the uh, March 28th meeting is scheduled to be in the council chambers. Okay. But Thank you. the best way to check, just check the website because location may change. All right. Item 10, motion to adjourn. May I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Six. All right. Thank you.
will be broadcast. Uh, you might just point that out. Yeah. It'll be on. It's not just tape. Andy Stroh was just in talking about that today. <laughs> I heard that, yeah. Russell was asked to um, bring forward a revised budget that showed what the community services budget might look like if the fitness center um, were included in that budget. So that's where we are. Can I ask something before we start? I'm, I heard from people after that they got very confused about what our role was. And I know what Mike just said is technically true, but to further explain to people, we do have a responsibility to approve or disapprove the budget. So there is a function in front of us. However, when we do it, we're not really sitting as a quasi-school board. We're sitting as members of the board, probably as a quasi-board director for community services. So that's why we had to tell people that once we approve it or disapprove it, but once we approve whatever we approve, it then goes to town council, who then either approves or disapproves the amount. But we are a necessary first step. A lot of people didn't understand that last time. They thought that although it's ultimately not our final call, it is a necessary prerequisite that we vote on or put and approve the budget. So people got understood that's the last time they're saying basically why do you even come here? We don't we don't decide it in the middle. It's just it's, that it goes the next step is second approval or disapproval by town council. Thanks. Okay. So as Meredith mentioned, I was asked to uh, resubmit my budget with the fitness center in it. And I believe you all have a copy of that. Um, <clears throat> the, the fitness center budget is an additional about $54,000, 53 dollars 56 And of that is 
uh, are ten thousand dollars which uh, will label contingency equipment something um, and it's really the crux for me of, of what it was all about last week that if we were going to have a a functioning well functioning asset in the community it is it was an asset that needed to um, be able to move forward and have upgrades and and to entice people to be members um, and so that ten thousand dollars is the key really for me in the budget um, and David and I have had a couple conversations uh, last week and and it's true it may or may not be spent it really is we need it there in case, um, although there's a piece of equipment that needs to be replaced already. So, um, so although it is probably a, uh, it probably will be spent, it may not be spent. Um, and, and we've talked about ways maybe of engineering uh, some sort of a reserve account or something where if, if that money stayed in there, it could grow. If we didn't use all 10,000 of it next year and, and, and the budget came back next year with the 10,000, it might be added to the 5,000 that was left over so that eventually if something did happen we'd have a little pot of money that that was just a kind of like an informal discussion we talked about <coughs> so anyway so I, I was asked to bring it back here's what it here's how it impacts it impacts the following um, the total budget now is 1.609067 1156893 which is community services including the fitness center and the 452174 remains the pool. As I said, it's an increase of uh, 53,000. Uh, I'm asking this, the most important thing, is a local subsidy increase of $9,994. I happen to like round numbers. That brings it to a flat 447. Of that $447,000, 262,174 would be earmarked as subsidy for the pool. 184,826 subsidy for community services, 10,000 of which I'm committed as subsidy for the fitness center. Um, that pretty much is it in a nutshell. Um, we would continue with the with the um, the swipe card system going forward. I, I believe the swipe card system, uh, which was the budget presented to you last year to just operate the fitness center, we're not talking about anything extra, just being to operate the fitness center can work. For me, it was, it was those things that I think need to happen in order to move it forward that I couldn't kind of account for in, in the budget. Um, so that's it. Um, so if, if you move this budget forward, it would be asking the town council for an additional $9,994 in local subsidy for community services. Clarify one point. Yep. Um, you mentioned that there is an increase of roughly fifty-three thousand dollars in expenditures to include the fitness center. Could you also yes. describe the offsetting? Yeah. The, 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 the revenues, the offsetting revenues, will be forty-three nine sixty-two. You know, right on that, just about that ten thousand dollar figure, um, and that's based on you know past history of what we're currently doing in there, our membership and what we're currently doing for, for fitness programs within that center. I feel pretty comfortable in that $43,000 number. John. Um, so I'm a little bit confused because my understanding when we met last week was that um, I guess we weren't looking at a, a, a real proposal for the fitness center, but, but because it wasn't part of the budget. Um, but I thought that we had an oper you were that, that that you were looking at an operating loss of about ten thousand um, dollars. But now it looks like we're looking at a, a essentially capital an additional capital expenditures of about ten thousand dollars. So what happened to that operating loss? Um, that operating loss is going to happen this year because the swipe card system did not get into place, and I've had to staff those hours with with labor. So you believe that the, the implementation of the swipe card system over the next fiscal year will eliminate the operating loss? Based on what I'm projecting right now, um, if the swipe card system had been in place this year, the, the numbers presented to this board last year would have been pretty close in labor. The, the, we could operate at 46, we can be open physically, not, yes, we can be physically open about 96 hours 
40 to 45 of those are, are staffed hours. Those are the, our labor costs. I'm not sure, John, I, I know where John's going, I'm not sure it was specifically answered, and maybe I can help. The point is, this budget now projected for next year includes the savings of the swipe card system. That's correct. That savings should be enough, so on an offering day-to-day -day basis, the fitness center should break even. The 10000 is an additional sum, because if we're going to do this, we would write, we should have a reserve fund for equipment, for maybe doing a little marketing, or whatever, but the difference between this one and last one is that the, this next year does factor in the savings of the swipe card system, which should make it break even, not have an operating loss. So the 10000 is something that wasn't in last year's budget, but in this year, because it was, I think, Russell determines that it's necessary to have that, to have a fund, you know, a, 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 you have a reserve for equipment failure during the year, and 10000 is a good amount to start off with, as well as maybe, I would hope, a little bit of marketing. I would also tell you that, um, must didn't mention it, but this actually increases the hours that the fitness center is open by over 30% by using the swipe card system. I personally believe that, that would bring in more people who would join it. That's the reason why a lot of people quit. They cut back the hours a lot, thinking that would save money. It did, but it lost people. So I mean, you can't predict it would bring in more people, but I think it's reasonable to say that the lease will break even. Is that correct? That's yes, question. that's correct. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's correct. And I'm not sure, and maybe I misheard your question. I thought you were asking if at the last meeting we were saying that there would be a $10,000 staffing need or a $10,000 equipment need. And I think Russell identified at the last meeting that the $10,000 at that time would be for capital to, to, op, to be able to update the equipment. That he was projecting that the swipe card could account for the staffing pieces, or alternatively, you could do both. You could not have a swipe card system, and then there would be an additional 10,000 in labor. Okay. It might be helpful given uh, which, you know, fitness center is one part of the overall budget, but I guess uh, you know, operating versus capital for, for most citizens that are interested in the fitness center, it sounds like. If the swipe, you know, we're estimating if the swipe card works as expected, if we have the enrollment, we, there's a lot of assumptions, but based on our, your best assumption, uh, it would break even, excluding uh, equipment outlay. Of yeah, my my revenue number is really just based on current members at the current rate that we're what we're currently doing. My expenses minus. The, uh, the $10,000 is basically what I'm projecting labor costs are for 46 hours a week, I think it was, for next, next year based on incremental increase in salaries and what minimal stuff that was in there. You know, uh, telephone, pay for the telephone, uh, some minor, equipment, uh, minor supplies, that was it. Most of that budget was labor. So some clarifying questions, yep. if I may. Um, so the new card swipe system, you are thinking in the fiscal year 2013-2014 um, next yep. year. Yep. That you still have $27,000 in labor costs. Yes. So you will still have at least some part-time staff. Yes. Okay. And then I, thank you. Okay. Um, the other, I have a second question. So there was some talk at the meeting last week about um, using this next year, or at least giving the fitness center one more year um, to see if the new card swipe system actually mm -hmm. does come to fruition and save us some of that staff dollars. And that there was an enormous um, support from the community to sort of form some sort of commission to see if there are other solutions or other things that could possibly um, be explored to make the fitness center a pay for itself. Mm -hmm. um, are there any plans or any further conversation? I know it hasn't been that much time, but um, do you think that that might be happening as well? There's two answers to that question. Mm -hmm. The first is that there was a group, I met with a group about maybe three or four weeks ago now. They called it a focus group. Uh, when word got out that it might be cut, um, and I'm meeting with them again early April. So there, yes, the answer to the first question is yes, we're talking about some things that could bolster 
um, the fitness center. And, and most of them, for them, it's more of bringing more, getting out the word to more of the citizens that this is a resource that's here and, and that they should be exploring that as an opportunity. That's the first part of that question. Second part of the question uh, for me is that as long as the swipe card system works, um, this, the, the fitness center can be as a program, I'm call, gonna call it a program now, as a program it can be break even, I believe. As a facility, it can't. Very similar to me for the pool. If we're talking about the programs that I run within the pool, they, they all make money. But without the local subsidy, the pool as the facility cannot break even. Does that make sense? Okay. Man, uh, I think we all realize that uh, there's some work to be done in terms of the mandate for community services. You know, how does community services overall mission rank as a, as a government service? I think there's a lot of feedback we received and have some you know strong opinions on that. I don't think we're gonna solve that riddle tonight. People have different um, expectations. I think you know there is some follow-up work we'll do as a board in terms of direction. So next year when we're reviewing the budget, there's a you know, here's the mission, here's the philosophy. So I, I know we have a lot of uh, we want to be responsive to the citizens, but I think it it might be hard. That might be a longer conversation you could have at a different time. Oh, I think it's absolutely a longer conversation for another time. But as far as the decision here tonight on whether we move forward and approve the budget, for me, I would want to know that, sure, this is a great band-aid, but is this going to be the long-term solution moving forward, or are there other plans in place so that we're not just going through this on a annual basis? And I'm hearing from you that there's been some... There's been some discussion. Yes, and the goal would be the goal would be that, um, well, the first goal would be that, that the number of local subsidy remained the same next year. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't go backwards. All right, in which case there was that ten thousand dollars, and, and and that would be for me. Uh, again, that's that's the 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 facility piece for me as, a, as opposed to the programming piece. It's, it's the equipment to, to upgrade and to make it a viable uh, asset. Um, as opposed to the center where people come in and, and use the equipment, that's the programming piece. And that's the piece I'm saying, I, I believe based on the card, swipe card system can be a break even proposition. Thank you. Okay. I just, We'll have one follow-up along mm -hmm. the same lines. Uh, many, many people who spoke the other night uh, expressed the belief that if somehow if marketing of the fitness center was done differently, that there would be a, a greater membership. Can you just respond to that? Is it, is it, is, I know this is your, your first year. I'll, <laughs> I, 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 so you don't have any responsibility for what marketing's been, been done, but as you look forward, um, and based on your experience in running community mm -hmm. services in other towns, do, do, is there an opportunity to increase membership um, through increased awareness in Cape Elizabeth, or is 100 members in a town of 10,000 people right next to Portland, where there's you know competitive gyms that offer you know for a little bit longer of a drive, they offer lower prices. Is that about the membership that we can expect? It's a million dollar question, I think. Oh, at least the 10, <laughs> I was going to say 10,000. Um, I think that's the unknown, really. Um, I think the 100 people who are members are passionate about it. You, you saw that last week. Um, and, and I think they want to save the facility. I think they're willing to, to get the word out, I think. And, and it really wouldn't take a huge number. If, if literally, if we got 20 more members, your revenue is going to go up, theoretically, 20% because we're at 100. Um, and that, in, this, in this item, I think it's a, that's a huge difference. Um, you go from like, you know, that, that fitness center is roughly $30,000 uh, membership money, $30,000, thirty dollars to $33,000. So you go up 20% on that, that's $6,000 right there. That's, that's more than half the tenth. So. so I know you focused a lot on the fitness center, but I think I mentioned this 
last meeting that the bigger, you know, for someone who isn't uh, focused on this, if you just simply read this, you'd say, well, local, the local appropriation for community services, I know there's some uh, liberty and house out there, is actually declining, and the largest appropriation is for the pool, which is actually increasing, you know, 4.9 percent. And I think you mentioned longer term, that's, you know, as you talk about the facility, that's the bigger issue. In terms of you know needs and requirements, I think you spoke about there's some you know fixed costs that are you know un, you know you can't aren't discretionary um, given they're fixed. But maybe just quickly comment on the citizen reading this will say, well community services the appropriations declining from last year, the pool's going up, and maybe just what are the one or two drivers uh, of that? I like you mentioned that the revenue part is limited given we're at the high end of the in the market, and you know, there's other alternatives with the cost, so if you could just flush okay. out some of those drivers. All right, from the pool perspective. The pool perspective has, it has a finite amount of revenue you're going to be able to generate based on the, the number of programs that you can run. So, you know, we're going to do our best to maximize that out, but, but short of raising fees, um, there's going to be a maximum amount of revenue that you're going to be able to get out of that facility. I would say this, that our, our, our swim lesson fees are higher than anybody around us. So it's not like I look around and say, well, you know, South Portland's charging basically uh, $8 an hour. We're charging $5 an hour. We can, you know, generate that revenue. So that's, so, so there's that, that piece is, it, it, it'll grow a little bit, but it's fairly stagnant. What isn't stagnant is, the energy, energy costs, which you know about in every other building. Um, there was some upgrades in the last year prior to my arrival at the pool uh, in, in, with basically fixing things, and Greg will tell you that. Um, and because of that, I think now things working, electricity's, you know, more electricity costs, more heating costs, more everything has gone up. And in fact, um, the pool the pool budget went up $18,000. I made some adjustments on some things, and, and most of that $18,000 is reflected in overhead costs. Um, so you know, if you're thinking about how do we deal with the pool long term, it really is a commitment that says we, we have to somehow figure out how to pay for that, for that piece of the pool. If those, if, if the energy, if suddenly oil is $9 a, a, a gallon next year, that there's going to be a huge spike in there. And, and I don't have the ability, because of that limited amount of, uh, of resource, programming resource, to, to generate that extra $9,000. Whereas, you look at community services as a whole, we're not, we're not limited in any way for the programming we may be able to offer. Because we use the school buildings, we use our own building. We use the fields. I mean, it's, it's endless what we could offer. Where with a the pool, there is a finite number that you could offer. Did that answer your question, Mike? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I think I just would like to thank you for kind of being the guardian of these tools of our community. And um, I just kind of reiterate kind of what Joe and, and Mary said last week that I think there should be an ongoing conversation, especially about the Will, you know, maybe raise the red flag before budget hits or something like that. Just well, which is why, I, yeah, and I, I, I could have just submitted the budget and just moved on. It was, it was a afterthought in my narrative that because of what we were going through with the, with the fitness center, and that maybe, and, and maybe they were, maybe conversation took place two or three years about to go about the fitness center, but, but I wasn't privy to that. I don't know, but I'm thinking. If, if two or three years down the road, suddenly that pool budget has gone up 35 percent, I'd be sitting here saying we can't operate it without some help. And you would be wise to say to me at that time, well, why didn't you say something three years ago so we could plan? So that's why it was just put on the table, it needs to be discussed, and, and a long-term kind of plan. So I think there's a lot of follow-up. Mandate, mission, vision for community services that we'll get to uh, over the next year. But does anyone have any questions on the specific budget before us uh, on the community services budget? 
I don't have any questions, but I would like to make a short statement, and I will keep it short. May I ask you, if, as a, we are going to vote on um, vote on this, so if you do have comments on supporting your decision, in my no problem. Support of the, the regular business meeting. No problem. I don't know when we are taking a vote now or not, but I'll wait until we get to the meeting to move on that We We won't we'll vote. We, we can't vote it now because it's a workshop, but we will reconvene a special business meeting in order to hold a vote if we have time. Okay. Later well, this evening. Later this evening, so we, if we have time. <laughs> so we, okay. we definitely will have time. We'll be voting on the research okay. tonight. So does anyone have any questions on this? So when we vote on it, probably 40 minutes. Don't laugh. It's going to happen. Get on there. Yeah, and I'll just note the board did submit um, a couple of questions in advance, and um, Jeff's had an opportunity to see those and have brought some information for you based on those questions. So we'll let him. Uh, I'd just like to begin as an athletic <coughs> administrator in these past few years, challenging economies. Um, my primary objective has been to maintain the integrity of the athletic program and provide uh, a quality experience for students who are participating in athletics. Um, at a cost of approximately 2.5% of the overall school budget, middle school and high school extra and co-curricular activities are one of the best bargains around. Um, it is in these vital programs where young people learn life lessons that complement the academic lessons taught in the classroom. That being said, um, given the current economic climate, fiscal responsibility is, is imperative. Um, I believe the budget I proposed to uh, the superintendent and the school board is a thoughtful one, is responsible, um, and looks very similar to our budget that we proposed last year, with a, few except with a couple of exceptions. Um, one being an additional coaching stipend for an assistant uh, varsity slash JV girls ice hockey. Um, and that is in compliance with uh, our Title IX and um, the phase in program that we adopted uh, five years ago. Also, uh, in the general operating budget, uh, you'll see increases in dues and fees. And those are high school and middle school league dues that have increased uh, that, we, that we're a part of. So that's about $1,000. Um, there's also an increase in dues and fees at the middle school level for um, impact baseline testing. Uh, that is addressing the state legislation for uh, a protocol or having a policy in place for um, dealing with head injuries. Uh, and then there's also a $1,500 increase in middle school equipment, which addresses some uniform needs. So the information that I had provided, I think there were some questions around um, participation numbers, both in the middle school and high school. So that first page uh, of your packet kind of addresses last the 2011-12 high school on the front and middle school on the back. Uh, this particular one at the high school level breaks it down by season and breaks it down by gender and also um, class as well. Um, that overall total participation around 75% has maintained. Um, that's been a pretty steady uh, 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 percentage in the five years that I've been here. Uh, that, that might go up one or minus one, but it is right in that range. At the middle school level, uh, looking at, and given that this is the first year middle school athletics is back in the, uh, or falls under the school umbrella, past a uh, couple of years that was uh, formerly under uh, community services, 
but since last year to this year, looking at uh, participation, again, actually uh, this current year we're up 10 in the fall. So last year we had 165 participating in the fall. Uh, this fall, 178, so 13. Uh, and then winter sports, we had 239 last year and this current winter, 219. So again, it's right in that plus or minus range. Um, so I'm feeling pretty comfortable where we are now with both the high school and middle school. Uh, given participation fees, um, that number has, has been steady. But, and then there was some other questions around um, some booster expenses. So on the following page, uh, look through all of the booster reports. Each, each year the uh, boosters are uh, submit uh, end of the season or end of the year booster report. And so I've broken down that by essentially uniforms, uh, additional coaches, dues, extra uh, dues and fees, additional equipment, end of season, and then there's some mis miscellaneous. So in 2011-12, boosters uh, total expenses was 243, 243,000. And so this kind of outlines where that expense falls into place. So the uniforms and apparel, are, it's a difficult number to establish because it's a combination of necessities, a combination of some extras, and a combination of um, things that the boosters may use for fundraising. So that number may look a little bit high, but um, as the, the school has a uniform uh, replacement program in place every five years. However, there are times where things may tear, things may get lost, uh, and that's where the boosters will help supplement that. Um, large, purport, large portion goes to additional coaches, assistant, uh, or first team. It's almost $50,000. Uh, there's some dues and fees where summer leagues, summer type programs, uh, some local, state, national coach registration certification, um, and then facility rentals uh, is another area where boosters may pick up the, the uh, additional above and beyond expenses. Um, end of season, things like awards, banquets, um, just about all the boosters have a scholarship that they provide for um, seniors that are graduating, uh, and then there's pretty large, it was difficult to break these up because it was such a large uh, variation of different things, donations, travel, overnight trips, uh, the game programs, rosters, team camps, porta potties so those kind of fell under the miscellaneous. And then at the bottom you'll see um, operating budget, then operating budget with uh, coaching stipends, and uh, 316,000 total. So looking at that, boosters, essentially about a third of total operating, uh, total operating budget, supporting about a third of that. So Jeff, we just, uh, on that first page, so total expenses for 2011-12, booster funded would be 243,017. Yep, and correct. The categories you broke out would be Yes. Um, and then just to help visual for um, just for some visual clarification, that last page just kind of breaks it up by sport and um, certain aspects of if it's district funded or booster funded by coaching stipend, travel, officials, dues and fees trainer, equipment. First of all, thank you so much for the first time. I've ever seen it. It helps us put in context how we respond externally as um, well as you know, the resources that are advocating. So it's extremely helpful. Yeah, um, and you know, the boosters, 
uh, the families in the, in the community just do an outstanding job of, of supplementing um, these programs. And we're really operating, uh, it's a no frills, modest budget. Um, and I think everyone tries very hard to recognize the, the climate we're in and uh, we're very fortunate to have such a great group of people to uh, work with. I have some clarifying sure. questions. Um, first, again, thank you. This is incredible to be able to look at this. Um, on, the, on the sheet with the breakout by team, under, um, under the equipment column, you, know, you have district and booster, whether it's district and booster funded, uh, but then there's an asterisk yeah. the district and on one page so that's booster funding? Yeah, so above and beyond what the district. So I just put a little asterisk just highlighting. Um, we basically are able to supply game essential equipment supplies. Um, so it's like, the, for instance, uh, practice balls. You know, that's where boosters would help supplement um, that part of the supply line item. Okay. So that's why I put a little, di little asterisk there. And at the bottom of page two, there's a little note that says a boosters fu booster funding above district budget. And one more question, just sort of where the rubber hits the road here is even after all of the booster funding and all of the 316,000 district funding at the high school and at the middle school level, what is the financial responsibility for players? Uh, there, uh, the athletic fee. Yeah, yeah. There's a participation fee at the high school level and at the middle school level. So at the high school, it's 150 for the season, or for the year, mm -hmm. and in the middle school, it is uh, $70 for the year. And that could be one sport, in middle school, four sports. If mm -hmm. right, it's an annual regardless. That's just great. Yeah, and there's. Um, uh, scholarship available for families that may need assistance, and that's similar to our free and reduced, or it's the same program as our free and reduced lunch. So our students, uh, student athletes, are supported 100% yeah. between the district and the And another piece to point out is uh, school board policy that booster fees aren't required. So. So in addition to the district participation fee, they also have to pay booster fees. Some sports, correct. Some sports. Yeah. Depending on um, the need. Some sports may not have an operational expense. For instance, football or cross country would look very different mm -hmm. given the nature of nature of the sport. I'm just having trouble squaring the, the booster expenses page with the with your budget. Um, can you can you help me? The, the budget proposals for one hundred and seventy-seven thousand. Um, yeah, and this was. I understand there's no salaries in, in that. So, it's, but and this so of, of that one hundred and forty-two. Yeah, the, it just makes sure you're, you're looking at to keep it consistent with the budget um, or with the booster fundraising for 2011-12. So that figure is 2011-12. Okay. Yeah. Not this current current budget, and it's, a, and it's the high school only. Yeah, so to keep to keep the booster and athletic um, numbers numbers this consistent. I, I used the 2000 because I only had 2011. I haven't received all of the booster financial reports because we're still we're still in season. Just to clarify, booster fees and revenues are not included. I'm just curious, 
Uh, if you took a look at the total amount it takes to, to, to the total amount of total expenditures, whether it's booster funding, activity fee funding, whatever, for the middle school and high school, what would that figure roughly be? How much the cost on that sport sports just well, I think if you take what their their expenses and what our budget is. Well, I, I, I have a little problem. I, I only have. Yeah. That's your preschool. So, why don't you because we don't have uh, we don't have a middle school booster. Okay, so if I had a 243 and 316, that would give you a pretty good idea of where we are. Yeah. So that's about five hundred and eighty-seven thousand, and that is this rate is confusing. So that's the total cost. So of the five hundred eighty thousand, uh, almost half, two hundred forty-three, is funded by boosters, and then how much is funded by activity fees? The activity fee would I mean, we're not per person, but total. Because I'm trying to find out the taxpayer, the net cost, the taxpayer. Of these programs is far less than the cost of these programs. I think we're. I think we forecast forty-five thousand in at the high school level. Yes. And twenty-three at the middle school. Um, nineteen. Nineteen. So forty-five and nineteen. And again, I think. Fifty-four. I just 64. caution you when you're looking at the uniform and apparel. There are extras in there, and there are necessities. The, the um, report, some boosters do a better job of providing detail in their report. Um, so I had to kind of lump it together. I'm just trying to point a, a general point, that both of those points. That the, the, cost, the cost of having all these athletic programs is somewhere around 550000 Of the 550000 about 300000 roughly. It's not paid for by the taxpayer. Correct. Mom? No, the 587000 is what the district is supporting in its budget. And then of, then there's an additional 243000 that is being supported by the boosters. So the district's covering about two-thirds, and boosters are covering the other one-third. Okay, how much the taxpayers cover, and how much should non-taxpayers cover? In other words, if we have to take out a gross budget, that's what I'm trying to get at, between activity phase, which is parents, Boosters, which is parents, how much roughly percentage does the taxpayer have in middle school and high school athletics? 123,000. Perhaps. I, Pauline's going to calculate that for you. Uh, While well, she's calculating that, can you explain how, where, how I can see in the, bud, the school budget that 500? I can. If you go to your. No. You have to. You would have to add the uh, sal under salaries and benefits. There's right. a section for athletics, which is on page 17 of the salary and benefits section. Okay. And also, orange cost is in the fields, capital improvement, capital maintenance, and so there's a allocation assumption. So rather than calling Chinese. I'm not asking for details. I'm just asking for help understanding the, the really big picture around that. Right. Right. Well, just so everyone knows, when you read Pond Cove, you know, high school Pond Cove, that's, that's, that excludes salary and benefits. I understand that. If you go to the side benefits line item, there's department goals for for different areas. So, so the the two pages are page 17 of your salary and benefits yep. section, where you see a total proposal for 1314 of 410,062 dollars, and then page three of the athletic section, where you see a proposal for 1314 of 177,665. That comprises the 587, and then you're deducting 64,000 that comes back in as a revenue through athletic fees that are paid by students and their families, and you 
and then there's that 243,000, or roughly that number that is, is provided by boosters, which doesn't show up in our budget anywhere. And that happened to be 2011-12. Right. Yeah. So roughly, you know, quick, roughly about half of the operating as opposed to the capital, operating cost of our excellent athletic system, which I think is vital to keep social maturity, is not funded by the taxpayer. It's funded by parents and boosters. About 307 out of what's... Out of three. About 307 out of the 130. No. No. About 307 out of about 330,000. So you're adding the boosters rough number of 243 plus the athletic fees that you're receiving of 64, right? That's the, the offset piece. And then you've got the 587 plus the 230 if you're trying to get a total expenditure for athletics. Although again, the, the boosters piece doesn't show up anywhere in our, in our operating budget. Yeah, I think this is something rather than trying to do these on uh, paper napkins, we can get a precise answer. Um, you know, I know I told I know I told you to move this along in a fast <laughs> quick. <Yeah. laughs> no, I'm suffering the consequences. I writing numbers down. I, so, well, can I ask one more question? Absolutely. The activity fees are for not just athletics, but other activities. Or are they just for athletics? These are athletic. Okay, so it could be called an athletic fee. Okay. Thank you. And, th and this particular paper was done just to sort of help break down where those the boosters are helping supplement. Um, so it's strictly high school. This part was strictly high school. We only have boosters at the high school level. Um, so even the um, department budget figures, those are high school. middle school it was uh, integrated back into the school uh, management supervision maybe just a quick update on, yep. on that and feel like that piece has um, been has transitioned well the uh, um, we've had support from uh, the middle school um, main office to help with um, collecting some of the activity fees so it either comes in sometimes it will come into the high school athletic office sometimes it will go to um, the middle school uh, so we all kind of collaborate together and make sure that everyone's fees are going to the right school. Um, and I think it, I think it's been beneficial. One of the one of the pieces that was sort of uh, uh, confusing for for uh, families was de determining what was when middle school athletics was kind of under the community service umbrella, determining what was a middle school program and what was um, a recreation or a community service program. So we, I think we've eliminated a lot of that uh, confusion. And it's been a long. I just had a quick question about the uh, activity fee. Um, is there any sort of help out there for families who um, might not qualify under the pre-reduced lunch guidelines but are still, that's a pretty low threshold. So is there anything else yeah. for families um, are above that? We've done some, you know, I've had families ask if they could do payment plans and things like that. And we just, we make that work for families and, and for students. Yeah. Um, I know last year we talked about how our kind of fees are in relationship to other towns. And we're, I'm assuming, since they haven't gone up, we're still very low. I mean, it's a con conscious decision by the school department to make sure that athletics were affordable? Is that I think we're in pretty, yeah, I think that number, I mean, looking at, I just happened to pull a sheet out. Um, it was from last year that I used in, in the budget presentation, and it listed Yarmouth, Falmouth, Cumberland, and a lot of those communities right now are doing per sport. Um, and I think having that uh, one Participation fee throughout the for the entire year um, is is uh, I think it's helped with our participation rate. Uh, it encourages people to participate, um, and I think it's, it's a, you know it's it's an expense yes at the beginning of the year, but um, I 
if you spread that out throughout the entire year, I think it, it is affordable. And it's, like I said, I think it's a pretty good bang for, for the buck. Well, we chose not to, you chose not to raise it um, because you wanted to keep it Yes, I think last year was, it went from 125 to 150, so this would be the second year. And then middle school, we decided, I think we came up looking at numbers from past budgets, that $70 would run a, a zero balance at the end of the school year. Some schools just implemented it last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's, there hasn't been necessarily a felt imperative to raise it, and because our boosters are so generous and our families bear so much of burden behind the scenes, and that's off any budget, whatever, I think there's probably been a lot of to, to raise it. <coughs> I think as listed on the agenda, consideration to adopt the 1314. You should include the number of the uh, budget. Is there any discussion? Um, I would like to add a little bit of short I did want to, I, I think it's important to note that uh, at our meeting, we uh, substantially traveled by the town in terms of the fitness, and I realize it's a small deal and a larger dog deal, but it is one of the series of issues we we'll ultimately end up discussing food and pool and so forth. And I'll leave for a later time, but I think the appropriate standard, which is not necessarily
provided them a lot of benefits. They actually would not have gone to a fitness center in Portland or elsewhere because they felt uncomfortable going, especially for senior citizens, going to a large commercial facility. Uh, the cross benefit of, of kids, parents, teachers, um, and senior citizens talking among each other, and the overall benefit of the uh, paid citizens, which I think the fitness center was demonstrated by the hearing, provides a unique. David, are there any other comments? Sure, I think uh, the budgets are very messy, um, and one of the best ways to gauge uh, at least how enthusiastic supporters are of a program, um, you know, to provide them an opportunity to advocate and ask questions, and I'm very happy to see the turnout. Um, I'm not certain that uh, you know, the long-term uh, strategy Well, I want to thank you too for, for bringing to us a, now a second budget. Um, I, I, I will express enthusiastic support for, the, for, the, for community services and everything that, that, that you do. I, I have to say that I wrestled a lot with the, the issue of the fitness center in particular, um, largely because while the value of the fitness center is clear, and I'm, I'm a user of the fitness center myself, um, it's certainly clear that the, the people who use it see a lot of value in it. Um, I wrestled with, with whether it's the proper role of the local government to be providing that service, which is very often provided by the private sector. That, that to me, was the, the, the thing I struggled with. And I know we provide other services, but rarely do we provide services that are so often provided by the public sector. Typically, we're providing services that aren't that are not um, uh, traditionally provided by the private sector or for some, some reason the private sector would fall, would fall short there. So I, I wrestled with that a lot and I'd, I'd really like to see over the next year the, the, the fitness center, um, the, the, the value of the fitness center to be borne out by way of uh, its ability to be operationally self-sufficient. Self 
Um, but I, I do appreciate you bringing um, to our attention the, the need to, to, to look at the fitness center as a community and to look at the pool as a community and to, and to really wrap our heads around the level of support we want to give those two um, facilities. So, so thank you. Uh, and that said, all those in favor of the community services budget or the, or the motion as read. Uh, have we read a motion? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. All those in favor of the motion. Read and second. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, then uh, I don't. I, do, I guess we need a motion to adjourn. May I have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. So one one second. Can I just have a, a, yeah. a procedural question because okay. I've already been asked this question. Okay. <clears throat> what will happen with this? from this point forward and what's the timeline because the same people who you saw last Tuesday are more than willing to be in this room on whatever the particular night is when the budget is in front of the town council. So the budget, the, what will happen is that the community services budget will, will go, move to the town council. Um, when, the, when the town council actually addresses the community services budget in their budget process, I'm not sure. But I, I, do you know? The present, the school board presentation is April 10th to the town council. Uh, the town council will vote on the total town and school and community services budget on April 29th. So is it April 10th people uh, should be here or April 29th? Uh, it's a regular town council meeting. It includes opportunity for budget public comments uh, Monday, April 8th. Um, so we will make sure that these dates are so those wishing to, you know, the, well, actually the town council will post uh, uh, updated schedule. So we will outline if people want to make public comments uh, on, on the budget, including the community services budget. Yeah, I was going to say, I, ju I, I think that is generally when they hear comments on the town budget and that the public hearing on, on the school budget, because they haven't voted on it at that point, they haven't formally had a presentation yet is the meeting is the 29th of April. Okay, so it's either, it's in April. But it certainly won't be before the 10th because that's when, yep, it's theoretically, presented. that's it's when this budget will be pre presented to them, I would right. think. Right. And is, is there any public comment? Public that hearing night? is on April 29th well, along know. with the budget uh, council vote. Okay. The town council Thank vote. you. I had the same people ask me that question. I think, and I told them they have to be real careful because sometimes they're moving private and we only have control over the child. Yeah. Ours are private moves, so I had suggested that they contact you and yeah. you married the meatball me as to when is the appropriate time for a public comment on uh, in the they should check in regularly. I, I, I think it's unlikely to be before April 29th. At this I'm not sure if they'll allow public I, I comment people, on the 10th. I think people need to check in with the town council on their on their schedule, and I, I wouldn't put that burden on on the administrators of community services. I would I, I would ask town council what their schedule is around. Who would they ask? The town clerk. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, May I have a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. All those in favor. Thank you. Thank you.